Well, welcome uh, to everybody at all of our locations. Thrilled that you're here this weekend. You could be a lot of different places doing a lot of different things, uh, but I think you made a good choice. And uh, we want to welcome you, uh, whether it's your first time or this is your church home. Uh, We're grateful uh, that you're here this weekend. We're in a series called Here I Am, and if you have a Bible, you can turn over to 1 Samuel chapter 3, and we'll get there in just a couple of moments. Let me just uh, mention uh, that in your, uh, on the way out uh, this weekend, you're going to get one of these at all of our locations, uh, six different postcards. And uh, these postcards uh, are invite cards, an easy way uh, to put something in someone's hand and say, would love for you to be able to uh, come with me to church. According to Barna Research, 80% of people uh, will accept an invitation on Easter Sunday. And so who is that person in your life uh, that doesn't have a spiritual family, maybe doesn't have a relationship with the Lord, uh, why don't you start praying for them? And then when the time is right, uh, you just give them one of these bad boys or uh, just invite them. Uh, Take them out to lunch, something like that. And I want to encourage you to pray and look for those opportunities. Well, we're going to read this scripture in just a moment. But before we do, let me try to frame this as best I can. Uh, I I think that... uh, everything traces back to the voice of God. Now, theologically, I think I'm on pretty solid footing because Genesis 1 says, in the beginning, and then what does it say? It says that God said, so God used his voice. Now, his voice, wow, uh, some serious ultrasonic and infrasonic power uh, behind that voice. Uh, We think of voice as just kind of words that are spoken, but... There's far more to God's voice than just saying something. In fact, his words are creative. They create things. They're that powerful. And so God said, let there be light. And those words began traveling at 186,000 miles per second, because that's how fast light travels. And those words began to Create. They left a wake of creation behind them. Uh, a minute uh, into creation, they were 11 million miles away. And those words have been traveling ever since. Now, I think it, it, the last I've seen, and of course, astrophysicists discover new galaxies all the time, and so it gets further and further away. Um, and uh, the last I heard, it was like 15.5 billion, but I'm sure it's, it's, we have discovered galaxies further away than that. And so those four words that God spoke at the beginning of creation are still creating galaxies at the very edges of the universe. Now, if my calculations are right, it was about uh, eight minutes, 25 seconds into creation that the sun would have come into, that's about the distance, and so that's a little estimate, but this idea that God spoke and creation happened, and that means everything that we see, everything that we can touch and sense with our five senses, we, we aren't really seeing as, a, it, it, as much as we are hearing an echo of God's voice. You are seeing the voice of God and his creation, the creation that he left in his wake. I think everything traces back to the voice of God. And uh, Genesis 1, in the beginning, God said, let there be light. Now, I think the same is true. It's the pattern of creation. that uh, That's how dreams come to an existence. Um, on Friday, we celebrated... Uh, Ebenezer's Day, that's kind of what we call it. It was the seventh anniversary of us opening Ebenezer's Coffee House. And uh, uh, let let me just share a few things about our our coffee house here on Capitol Hill. And some of you have heard this, but here's a little uh, updated uh, version. On March 7, uh, or March 15, 2006, um, we opened that coffee house. Now, from that day to this day, we've served more than a million customers. Now, McDonald's isn't going to be impressed with that. 
But that's not bad. You know, we've had a million people pass through the threshold of one of those doors, doors that, by the way, we prayed over those door frames that when people walked in, they would sense and know the presence of God. And there are so many stories of the way that God has used that coffee house to, that people have gotten more than a cup of coffee. Uh, many people have found a relationship with Christ there and some incredible testimonies of what God has done. Uh, last year, we served 65,500 16 cups of coffee. Uh, to date, uh, we've given away all of the net profits, uh, which would total $675,000 would be the ballpark. Now you give it 10 or 20 years, what, what's going to happen is we're going to give away millions of dollars uh, towards missions, towards uh, Christ-centered causes right in our backyard. Um, and so God has done some incredible things uh, through Ebenezer's. Uh, our first affiliate will be opening up in Charlotte, North Carolina, and you give it enough time, and we'll have some other uh, Ebenezer's coffee house um, in the D.C. area. I don't think Starbucks has to be nervous. <laughs> But it's coffee with a cause and a uh, lot of divine appointments. Well, how, how did it start? Well, you know what? I, I don't want to oversimplify this, but, you know, one, one day in 1997, uh, you know, rookie pastor, uh, we lived on Capitol Hill. I was walking down to Union Station where we were meeting, and it's hard to describe, but as I walked by this old crack house, that it was the kind of building that you didn't look at, and you kind of picked up your pace a little bit um, just to walk past it. I mean, it was on the nuisance property list uh, in the District of Columbia, and uh, as I walked by, I don't know how else to say it, like I heard a little whisper that said this crack house would make a great coffee house. The problem is, is we had no money and no people. And so, like that dream, I felt like I was on crack. Um, I don't think I've ever said that in a message. <laughs> and I may never say that again. Um, it was a pipe dream. I can keep going. I'm here all day, folks. Um, I, so we started praying around that property. We started circling it in prayer. And uh, it was five years until we could find, because the owners wanted a million dollars for it. But this is so cool. The more we prayed, the more the price went down. And so we ended up buying it for $325,000, the property. And then we built uh, that coffee house, and we named it Ebenezer's. Why? Because uh, in 1 Samuel 7, 12, uh, Samuel builds an altar, names it Ebenezer. It's a Hebrew word. Here's what it means. Hitherto, the Lord has helped us. Now, if you ever look at the coffee sleeve on a cup of coffee at Ebenezer's, you'll see uh, 1 Sam 7, 12, and a lot of people who wouldn't know the Bible wouldn't even know, like, is that like some skew code or something? Um, and, and then the initials F, uh, SFSG. Um, now, a few of you would know what that stands for. Uh, it was kind of our translation of hitherto the Lord has helped us, which is what that word means. Our translation is so far, so God. Not so far, so good. No, that would take God out of the equation. So far, so God. Now, that dream is a beautiful thing. And God's gonna continue to multiply it and use it. But here's what I'm trying to say. Like everything else, it started with a little whisper with trying to hear the voice of God. This crack house would make a great coffee house. I think it's that way with everything. Um, this weekend uh, is St. Patrick's Day, right? Uh, let me give you a little bit of history. When St. Patrick was 48 years old, which was already past a, a man's life expectancy in the fifth century, he had a dream. In that dream, uh, which really changed the course of Western history, Patrick heard the voice of his former captors who had kidnapped him when he was 16 years old and then he miraculously escaped, by the way, hearing a voice that told him to flee. Pretty incredible. And then he hears another voice, we entreat thee that thou come and henceforth walk amongst us. Now, Patrick did just that. Returned to Ireland as a missionary. By the end of his ministry, he had planted 700 churches. 
ordained a thousand pastors and baptized 120,000 new believers. And so, um, about 1,500 years, what we do is we drink green beer in his honor. <laughs> if St. Patrick came back on his day, how confused would he be? What are you doing and why? Um, I mean, to really honor the legacy that he left, we would be uh, planting churches, ordaining pastors, and baptizing new believers. So he went back to Ireland and it began this Irish revival that really gave birth to almost really, not the first, but one of the strongest expressions of non-Romanized Christianity. And something that we call Celtic Christianity, which I fell in love with uh, a lot of years ago. In fact, uh, that's where I discovered that uh, the Celtic Christians called the Holy Spirit on God gloss, which means the wild goose. And so that's where the book Wild Goose Chase, which is the second book that I wrote, came from. Well, in a sense then, um, that book traces back to St. Patrick. If you trace it all the way back, do you see how everything connects back to the voice of God somehow, some way? We've got to hear his voice. That is the pattern of creation. I, I think here's what I'm trying to get at. You don't need to hear a word I have to say this weekend but we need a word from the Lord, don't we? Don't we need to hear the voice of God? And when you hear the voice of God, it's the game changer. And so that's what we're talking about this weekend. All right, let's jump in. First Samuel chapter three. Now the boy Samuel was ministering to the Lord in the presence of Eli. Uh, just a quick little note here, if you're taking notes. Uh, we have two ministries. One of them you could say is horizontal, and the other you could say is vertical. Uh, the horizontal ministry, and it's what we tend to think of when we hear the word ministry, and that is ministering to one another. But there is a vertical ministry, and that's our ministry to the Lord. What does it say? It says that, that uh, Samuel was ministering to the Lord. Now you go and read Acts 13, a, a turning point as the church went from kind of, not, not this like introverted deal, but like, hey, um, we have got to get the gospel to everybody. The turning point was just as they were fasting and praying, and it says as they were ministering to the Lord. Can I tell you that every turning point in your life is going to happen when you begin to minister to the Lord? Do you have a ministry to the Lord? That's not coming to church. Now, that's wonderful, but that's not a ministry to the Lord. A ministry to the Lord is when you're in your, your kind of personal, private prayer closet, if you will, where you're singing to the Lord or praying to the Lord and you're blessing him and giving him the worship that he deserves, where there's communion between your heart and the heart of God. And then here's what happens. See, if your horizontal ministry, and all of us are called to ministry, right? We're all priests. Then if your horizontal ministry isn't out of the overflow of the vertical ministry, then it will fall flat and it will ring hollow and you honestly won't make much of a difference. But if you can establish this horizontal ministry that comes out of the overflow of this vertical ministry, then God can begin to do some powerful things among you. And you know what? Samuel wasn't too young. It says he's a boy but he's ministering to the Lord in the presence of Eli. And the word of the Lord was rare in those days. There was no frequent vision. At that time, Eli, whose eyesight, he began to grow dim so that he could not see, was lying down in his own place. The lamp of God had not yet gone out. And Samuel was lying down in the temple of the Lord where the ark of God was. Then the Lord called Samuel and he said, here I am. And ran to Eli and said, here I am for you called me. But he said, I did not call, lie down again. So he went and lay down. And the Lord called again, Samuel. 
And Eli arose and went to, uh, Samuel rose and went to Eli and said, here I am for you called me. But he said, I did not call you, my son. Lie down again. Now, part of you would think that Eli would start picking up on this sooner. But if you have kids, you totally understand this. <laughs> like, you know, he's a boy. Maybe he's missing Hannah, his mama. Um, and, and so, like, I don't know, is he scared? I don't know if I'm, if I'm laying down. If my bedroom is in the temple near the ark of the Lord... Like, you might have a few psychological issues to deal with, like, if that's your bedroom. And so, you know, they don't really know what's going on yet, but Samuel keeps going to Eli. Now, Samuel did not yet know the Lord, and the word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. Again, I'm just going to say this because I'm going to... I'm. I'm I want to make sure that we're all on the same page. You can come to church and not know the Lord yet. Okay? You can come to church and not yet experience the revelation that you need. This is not about coming to church. This is about uh, surrendering your life to the Lordship of Jesus Christ, who we believe is the sinless son of God, who died on the cross for our sin, who was raised on the third day and is seated at the right hand of the father. This is all about relationship with him, this vertical relationship. But church is a place where we come together and we gather as a spiritual family and we minister to the Lord and we minister to one another. But let's make sure that we don't confuse the issue here. You can come to church and not yet know the Lord. And I pray that today you would discover and find him. And the Lord called Samuel again the third time. And he arose and went to Eli and said, here I am for you called me. Then Eli perceived that the Lord was calling the boy. Therefore, Eli said to Samuel, go lie down. And if he calls you, you shall say, speak Lord for your servant Hears. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. Let me stop there. Speak, Lord, for your servant hears. I think there are two primary reasons why we don't hear the voice of God. I'm not talking about the audible voice of God. I'm talking about the ability to discern that God is really speaking to you in some form or fashion. I think there are two reasons, primary reasons, why we don't hear from God. The first is this. We don't want to hear what he has to say. And it's usually because there's sin in our lives. Sin does not just harden our heart. It hardens our hearing. And so we tune out God's voice because we don't want to hear the convicting voice of the Holy Spirit. I think this is especially true when it comes to sexual sin. We want to do what we want to do without any consequences. But the consequence of tuning out the convicting voice of the Holy Spirit is spiritual deafness. And if you don't listen to everything the Spirit has to say, you won't hear anything. It's a package deal. Here's what I'm trying to say. If you don't listen to the convicting voice of the Holy Spirit, you won't hear his comforting voice. You won't hear that powerful, creative voice. You won't hear the loving voice, the graceful voice, the wise voice. Why? Because if you aren't willing to listen to everything he has to say, you won't hear anything he has to say. Let me talk about that convicting voice for a moment because that is certainly not something we should perceive in a negative way. That's a wonderful thing. Uh, we have a God that loves us too much to let us just kind of go our way without speaking that word of conviction that you're gonna hurt yourself. It's gonna take you where you don't wanna go. And, and yet sometimes we're like, like, can you imagine? You ever been in the, in the uh, you know, doctor's office and, you know, they take the x-ray or MRI or whatever, or, you know, take your vitals and then they come back in and, you know, drum roll, diagnosis, you're ready for that moment. Have you ever in that moment, just as the doctor is about to give you the diagnosis, done something like this? 
I can't hear you. I don't want to hear you. I can't, la, 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 la. Um, or, or better yet, taking their stethoscope and yelling it. <laughs> um, like, it, that would be so silly. Like, you might, might not like the diagnosis, but you better get it. Because it's the only way you're going to find out what the problem is so that you can find out what the solution is so that there can be some prescription, some remedy, something that's going to help you uh, begin the healing process in your life. That's what the convicting voice of the Holy Spirit is for. Now, it's not a voice of condemnation. That only comes from the enemy. Uh, There is no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus. Now, the difference between convicting and condemning is this. If you confess your sin, but you continue to feel guilt over it, that's condemnation, and that comes from the enemy. But if you're in the place where you're hearing some of that, like, oh, man, I don't feel so good about this or that or the other thing, my friends, that is the convicting voice of the Holy Spirit. And it's a loving voice and it's a caring voice. And if you don't listen to that voice, you're not gonna hear anything that the spirit of God has to say. And so if you aren't hearing the voice of the Holy Spirit, then you need to just ask yourself, is there a sin issue in my life? Do I really want to hear what the Spirit of God has to say? It takes tremendous courage, moral moral courage to hear that voice. Um, And the problem is, is that anger or lust or pride or greed, what happens is if we allow those things to drown out the voice of the Spirit, we miss opportunities and the opportunity costs are staggering. And so what happens then is we become an impotent people. Empowered by the omnipotent God, we become impotent because we can't even hear his voice and know how to act. And so our greed allows us to walk by someone who is in such desperate need that we can't even perceive it. And we just go our way as if nothing just happened. Or there's someone who's genuinely hurting And our pride or our anger, our own issues causes us to stand in judgment of them instead of figuring out what's causing the behavior in them that I really don't like. Because there's probably some deep hurt that needs some healing from God. And so we miss it because we don't want to hear what God has to say. Now, the second reason that we don't hear God is that we aren't quiet long enough to actually hear his voice. We're too busy talking, too busy moving, doing, acting, trying to do God's job for him. And what we need to do is just be still long enough to actually hear his voice. Um, I was having a conversation this week. A um, wonderful couple in the church had Laura and I over to dinner and, and we were talking. They asked us about Israel. What were the, the moments? And, you know, there were so many of them that it was hard to isolate. But one of those moments for me was when we first got there and we walked into the wilderness of Zin. Kind of, we had been to Beersheba where, you know, Abraham uh, plants a tamarisk tree and digs a well. And, and, and then near there is this wilderness. And we walk, we hike into the wilderness of Zin. And, uh, and the guy told us, now this is in proximity to where Elijah heard that still small voice. Wasn't in the wind, wasn't in the earthquake, wasn't in the fire. And he said, We're just going to take five minutes and just be silent. It was awesome. We just sat there and in that stillness, it was incredible. It was like the Lord began to speak to some of us and it was only five minutes. And so over dinner, one thing that came up and this was fascinating to me is that, uh, Uh, the couple that we were with, she began to describe the way that she does silent retreats. And just for, you know, 24 hour period or for even longer, we'll just go into a season of solitude and stillness. Um, 
What does Psalm 46, 10 say? Be still and know that I am God. If you aren't still, you'll forget that he is God. Be still and know that I am God. And so I think what we need to do is become a little bit more comfortable with silence in our relationship with the Lord and in our relationship with each other. Now, this is hard for me. I'm gonna be honest. Like I grew up in one of those families where if there was like five seconds of silence, it, was, it got weird. <laughs> um, and so like, then you would just be quickly grasping for the next topic of conversation because it would really not be good to be together and not be talking all the time. And I think, I think what I've had to learn is that we need those moments of solitude and silence. Let me tell you, last weekend was incredible here at NCC. Uh, I, I uh, preached the last service at our gala location uh, up in Columbia Heights. And afterwards, um, it was rich. We kind of dismissed, and, and, but most people stayed. And we just had a season of seeking the Lord. And in those moments, here's what I've discovered. Okay, this is me just sharing kind of how... I'm wired in the way it works with me. Uh, these spiritual gifts that are talked about in 1 Corinthians uh, 13, 14, a uh, couple of them, word of wisdom and word of knowledge. These gifts are very difficult to fully understand exactly how they work, how do they operate. Um, but what I've discovered is that oftentimes if I get quiet long enough and if I'm, if I'm just still, that often I'll get an impression um, from the Lord. Now, I don't want to make this any weirder than it needs to sound. And, and I'll be honest, I don't always know. Is like this some idea that I have or some thought I have? Or is this something that the Lord's given to me? Like, you don't always know. But, but often there's an impression that you feel like it's not something that you just kind of conjured up on your own. And, and so what happened on Sunday night as I was um, praying for people and kind of walking as people were at the altar, um, I, I just sensed that the Lord said, you are not 99% forgiven. I had the strongest impression that there was someone there that was not able to forgive themselves, maybe 1%, but just was having the hardest, hardest time really receiving the full grace of God. And I felt like what the Lord spoke to me. And so I just simply got up and, and I didn't like, thus saith the Lord, or like start using King James language. I just simply said, I just felt this impression. I feel like it's for someone here that you need to understand that you are not 99% forgiven. Now, 1 John, and you always have to test it with scripture. 1 John 1, 9 says that if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all, all, 100%, not 99.99%. No, cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So what happened in that moment? Well, I think in that moment, God took his timeless truth, which is the word of God, and said, I have a timely message for someone who's really wrestling with this tonight. And, and I think that that little simple truth hopefully blessed everybody, but for one person, I think it could have been life-changing. You are not 99% forgiven. We have got to dial in so that we can hear, be still and quiet long enough so we can hear the still small voice of the Spirit. Well, that's why we don't hear the voice of God. Should we like talk about why, how we do? So let's flip the coin a little bit. I'm gonna give you four quick things and you can just jot these down. I'm gonna talk about them real briefly. Number one, God speaks through his word. Now, that's the Bible and uh, this is mine. This year I happen to be reading the uh, uh, ESV version um, English Standard Version, kind of liking it, decided to pick up a new version. Um, and so this is my Bible. And uh, here's the deal. When you open the Bible, God opens his mouth. Because this is the word of God. And the same spirit who inspired the word then begins to speak into our lives. Now, I don't want you to, to get this impression that like every time I open the Bible, it's like, ha, you know, ha, ha. Huh? Like, no, 
Like, it, it is not that. The, the Bible is equally inspired, but not equally applicable. There are parts that don't always speak to you the same way that some other parts do, but, but that's the timeless inspiration of God's word. And, and, and so one way that God speaks is through his word. Uh, God speaks through his creation. Now, I'm not even gonna talk about that because we, we said, in the beginning, God said, let there be light. And so all of creation really uh, is an echo of God's voice. And so that's why so many of us feel so close to God when we're, we're in the middle of nature, something that's incredibly beautiful. Why? Because we're hearing his voice, because we're seeing it. And so God speaks through his word, through his creation. Uh, God speaks through people. Now, it was Eli that helped Samuel discern the voice of the Lord. Isn't that great? Like Eli kind of took Samuel under his wing. And I think what's happening is God's trying to speak to you. And here's what you should do. You should say, speak, Lord, your servant hears. Um, I had a conversation this week with, uh, with Dick Foth. And uh, he shared something with me. We talked for a while. And then right before we hung up, he was like, hey, do you have two more minutes? He said, I've got to tell you about something that just happened two weeks ago um, that, uh, that's never happened to me before. I was like, yeah, tell me about it. He said, so I was preaching at Timberline, his church in Colorado. And he said, I was preaching kind of the same message I preached the last time at NCC, kind of his sex talk. And so um, he was talking about this topic or theme. And, uh, and he said, right in the middle of my message, he said, Mark, this has never happened to me before. I had this incredible impression that there was someone there that was about to have an affair. And I felt like I needed to stop and just say something. And so he said, I was just like, he said it was crazy, but I just, in obedience to the Holy Spirit, he said, I stopped and I said, um, he said, I, uh, he said, someone here has set themselves up for an affair. The circumstances are in place. The person is in place. And you were planning on making that decision today. The Lord is telling you, don't do it. And then just started preaching again. He said, at the end of that service, a guy got up kind of middle to the back of the sanctuary and just came up. He said, he came up and just gave me a hug, kind of... Um, you know, pressed his cheek against mine and whispered in my ear, he said, that was me. Thank you. And left. Now, I don't know. I think that maybe, well, an affair was averted. A marriage was spared the pain and hurt and betrayal that comes with that. And who knows how that will impact future generations. Sometimes God speaks through his people. His word, his creation, his people. <coughs> and finally, God speaks by his spirit. His word, his creation, his people, his spirit. Let me talk about this for a moment because that's what this story is about. This is about Samuel trying to discern the voice of God and understand what it meant when God spoke. And, and again, this is so hard, but here's what I would liken it to. Um, uh, I got a text message this week from Pastor Dave, who's our campus pastor uh, at our Gala location. And uh, he said, hey, I'm, I'm gonna start taking Hebrew. Um, you know, some people go to Israel and decide to take Hebrew. Uh, and so he was like, I'm gonna learn the language. And he invited me to come and it worked out that I couldn't, couldn't go. I was a little bit jealous. And so he went and he said, I'm, I'm gonna start learning the Hebrew language. Um, uh, and so I saw him the next morning. And uh, um, do you think uh, he was fluent? <laughs> uh, no, I'm sure he, like I, are still mispronouncing uh, words. Um, it, it, language isn't something that you acquire like this. I mean, it'd be silly. Like, oh my, like I've already taken one class and I don't even know this language yet. <laughs> like, no, that would be silly to get frustrated. No, language acquisition is incredibly challenging and difficult. And then really you have two challenges. One is saying it and the other is, is hearing it. 
And many people would say that it's the hearing part that's even more challenging. That's why a little baby is exposed to a language because of the way the synapses form and the brain um, uh, evolves. Man, if, you, if your auditory cortex had the luxury of hearing some of those kind of pronunciations early on, like you are way ahead of the curve. And if it's later in life, it's gonna be a little bit harder because of the, the speed of someone speaking and accent and things like, it's just so hard to pick up on the nuances of a language. Like, it is, is learning the language of the spirit of God any different? I, I think it's so the same that it takes a long time to perceive was that the Holy Spirit or was that me or was that the pizza? It's not easy. And, and again, the, the, you know, um, I don't have any kind of cure-alls or immediate solutions, but um, it's about us positioning sell ourselves in a way that says, God, I wanna hear you speak. Well, for the sake of time, uh, let me close with this. I wanna share a story with you that I got this week. And I love sharing testimonies. Um, and so let me take the time to do that and then we're done. A uh, woman emailed me this week and said, I live in London. A friend sent me a copy of The Circle Maker from Australia. For seven years, I've been working on a book. My husband is a vicar in one of the poorest and most deprived areas of London where we live with our two children. We had an awful year in church life. You know, sometimes it goes like that and I felt at the end of my tether. I felt like our lives were over for six weeks straight, I clean forgot about the resurrection. I forgot that betrayal, loss, and death are all ingredients for the resurrection. So then God just ignited a revival in me as I started to read your book, started dragging myself out of bed and praying for an hour each morning, started to ask God to bring revival in me. And, and I also asked for his guidance on earth uh, on who on earth was going to publish my book, I had no contacts or means of contacts with the publishing house. So I started praying for a way in and uh, kind of imagining Jericho. As with all large publishing houses, there is no way in on their website, no contacts, emails, or names. It was like a fortress. And I started circling this fortress in prayer. My husband woke one morning and said that he had a dream of us banging on the door of a fortress. That's what I was doing. One day when scouring the website of a publishing house, I noticed that they had offices in King's Cross. We live about two miles from their UK office. And so I decided to go there and start praying around it for a way in. And so began a series of walks to pray those walls down, to pray for favor, to pray for a way in. Shortly after, I woke one morning and out of my mouth came the words, thank you, Lord, for giving the publishing house into my hands. So day after day, week after week, for roughly a month, I prayed morning, noon, and night. I just kept circling that building in King's Cross. Well, one morning as I walked the streets to King's Cross, I laid it before the Lord. I said, Lord, I'm sick of praying. I'm so tired of it. I wanna feel the boom that Mark Batterson talks about. Now that's a reference to this chapter in the book where I talk about a, sometimes a sonic boom goes off in your spirit when you know you have prayed through and the answer, though not in physical reality delivered yet in the spiritual realm, it's done. She said, I wanted to, to feel that boom. I literally felt exhausted, but after one minute after saying, God, I just want to feel the boom, a bus went past. I have attached the picture to this email. <laughs> now, to those of you who are listening by podcast, since you can't see the picture, in great big letters, here comes the boom. Come on. I stood there laughing on the street. People stared. I took this picture because I wanted to capture the moment because it was such a miracle. I didn't want it to get away because I might doubt that I had seen it at all. She said, I have a picture of it now up in my kitchen. Another month went by, nothing. 
I carried on reading the circle maker, felt so encouraged by it, but now God had established a pattern in my life with getting up early and priming my day in prayer. Now that's a language that I use in the book, priming uh, the day in prayer. Uh, she said, then I received an email from a senior editor with a publisher in New York. Here's what it said. Just wanted to circle back with you because they had made contact before this. Just wanted to circle back with you that we are primed to go forward with your book. She told me that they were ready to move forward with the manuscript, which is amazing. But seriously, circle back. I dropped to my knees, primed, primed in prayer. I still marvel at her use of language. There was no way she could have known the significance of those words. It was a magnificent breakthrough. And then finally, here's what she said. All my life I have written. I wrote my first poem at seven. Sent off my first story to a children's publisher when I was 11. Now I will be a published writer and the book will be available in the United States. So to sum up, I've experienced a revival I did not think possible in my heart. God has somehow set my life right again. He has given me a major secular publishing house into my hands. He has launched a writing ministry that has been brewing in me for nearly, and here it is, three decades. If the Lord has spoken to you, don't you let go of it. Don't you give up on it. The Lord is speaking. The question is, are we listening? Do we wanna hear what he has to say? Are we willing to hear it? Are we quiet long enough to hear what he has to say? May the Lord give us ears to hear. Let's pray. Father, help us respond to your word today. Let it take root and bear fruit in our hearts. God, I pray for those who have been waiting a long time for that boom in their spirit. Lord, I pray that your spirit would speak to our spirit right now. We're not trying to manufacture something in our own strength or wisdom or our own timing. But God, I believe that to some of us, you are saying, here comes the boom. That the God who has spoken is the God who is gonna deliver on the promise, is the God who is going to bring healing, is the God who is going to make that dream become reality. The same God as Hannah was, was for year after year after year, the joy had drained out of her life because she could not get pregnant. And yet one day as she was in the presence of the Lord, she said, you're gonna have a child. And, and she said, then I will lend him to the Lord for his entire life. That's how Samuel was born. She heard from you a promise. She held on to it. And then her child began to hear your voice. God, we wanna hear your voice. May you speak to us and may you find a people that are saying, here I am. In Jesus' name, amen.